Welcome to this afternoon's session and it's a very interesting session we've got. The first time at the Read that we've tried this and what we're looking at doing is having a series of presentations given by leading manufacturers in the area of bioanalysis and also then having an open forum where we can start to discuss the future of bioanalysis. Um, I get the pleasure of introducing not only the session but also um, of presenting the first set so let's start. Um, my name is Tony Edge and I'm the R&D manager for Agilent Technologies looking at developing new stationary phases and also new extraction phases as well. I'm going to be talking about bioanalysis and beyond. Where should we be taking bioanalysis in the future? So let's move on to the next slide. I'm going to be giving a review of some of the current technologies um, and that will include sample handling and sample preparation. So my presentation will focus very much on these areas. I'm then going to be talking about some of the current challenges and drivers for change within the industry. So in particular, looking at iron suppression and also noting some of the challenges that we face um, due to the regulatory challenges that are out there for all of us by analysts. Then move on to some of the technologies that are available for today. So looking at some types of different sample tubes and also looking at dry blood spot analysis. And then this is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting is start to look at some of the technologies of the future that are potentially available today. And this will look at the use of CD type technology. Um, also look at the use of direct analysis technology and how we can apply that to the field of bioanalysis. And then finally, I'm just going to let my imagination go wild and really start introducing the kind of Star Trek type concepts of how bioanalysis in the future really will start to change and we'll see massive developments in this area that start to look at not just advances in terms of the way we do it technically, but also in terms of the uh, the use of bioanalysis. So looking at the consumerization, if you like, of this whole approach and looking at taking the technology outside of the laboratory and making it accessible to us all. So let's have a look at today's current technology in terms of sample handling. Um, and it really is quite depressing when we look at it. It hasn't changed much at all. So we have deep well 96 plates. We have um, a series of collection vessels, plastic tubes, glass tubes, etc. But all of this technology really hasn't developed substantially over the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. The new exciting step in bioanalysis for sample collection was dry blood spots. But even that technology, these, the Guthrie approach to blood analysis has been around 50 or 60 years. So even the new ideas that we have in sample handling are really not that new. And so when we look at this, it's, it's actually quite depressing because we really haven't taken this on at all. And there are loads of ways in which we could start to develop this further, as we'll see. So this is where we are in terms of sampling handling today. I'm also going to talk about the sampling, other sampling devices as well. And if we look at some of the technologies that have been brought out recently, we do start to see some advances here but again it's it's not radical it's not really revolutionizing necessarily the way we do bioanalysis accurate volumes are becoming more and more important and we can look at approaches um, such as the neoteryx and hemapen um, from trajan that really do look to address this here we're taking an accurate volume of blood and using that in order as our primary sample. The fact that it's an accurate volume overcomes many of the issues associated with dry blood spotting, such as the hematocrit issue. Other technologies that are around are monolithic stationary phases that allow us to differentiate between plasma and red blood cells. This again is moving us forward. It's relatively old technology. We can have a look at the approach that um, Shimadzu, the SPEMI type approaches that are being introduced. Um, but again, it's technology that has been around for some time. And so, yes, it may change by analysis, but ultimately it's not going to revolutionize necessarily the approach that we've got. But it's very encouraging that 
companies are starting to look at this area and say, actually, there are improvements that we can make in terms of sample handling. And so there are devices available now which are starting to rethink the way we do sample handling, either in a clinical or a preclinical setting. Going forward, there are certainly other types of devices that are more geared towards consumers rather than just looking at laboratory type environment. And so the Tasso, the FluiSense, Seventh Sense, Spot on Sciences, etc., are now devices that are geared to the mass populace. And perhaps this is where we should be looking for technologies of the future, being able to address the mass populace interest in, in health and in well-being. And this could well be a driver going forward. So these devices are available today and we can use them today. And so this potentially could be the driver for the future. In terms of sample preparation, um, again, we've not really seen substantial improvements or substantial developments in terms of sample preparation. Many laboratories still use protein precipitation. Um, typically using a three to one ratio of organic solvent to, to plasma or, or blood. Um, centrifugation or filtration follow this. And then we take the supernatant and analyze that directly on an LCMS. Solid phase extraction, if we want to do a degree of pre-concentrating or we've got some matrix issues can be used. And here there have been some developments, but really not substantial developments. And so we're still very much using the reverse phase and mixed mode phases that we've developed 20 odd years ago, perhaps even 30 years ago. Liquid-liquid extraction in both its guises, so straightforward liquid-liquid extraction or supported liquid extraction, again, have been around for a substantial amount of time. Yes, in terms of its applicability and in terms of its understanding, bioanalysis are increasing their education standards here. But again, it's still relatively old technology. We're not really seeing developments here. And I think really we need a radical approach to the way we look at this type of technology. One where we start to look at what that sample workflow process is and one where we look to try and address the bigger issues that are faced, not just within the pharmaceutical environment, but going beyond that and looking at the, at the mass populace. There are other approaches that we could use to increase the um, or reduce the amount of iron suppression or reduce the, the complexity of the sample. And so catches is used traditionally a lot within the food and environmental industry. A very quick and easy approach, very cheap approach, perhaps not so applicable to bioanalysis where we're looking not at necessarily just removing matrix, but looking at extracting specific compounds. Turbulent flow chromatography, something I've been involved in for quite a large part of my life, again, is very interesting and absolutely it works. But are we seeing massive developments in these areas? Um, what about ligand binding assays, immunodiagnostics? These are areas that we've been discussing at the read this week. And perhaps they could be areas where we should be doing more work in. Beyond that, ultracentrifugation, ultrafiltration, these again, technical technologies that have been around for a degree of time. Um, should we be moving in that direction? I'm not too sure. I think there may be better approaches that we could utilize. So what are the drivers for, for change? What are the current challenges that we face in terms of bioanalytical science? So one of them is collection of a known sample volume. At the moment, the addition of internal standard is routine, and this offsets the fact that we can't necessarily collect a known sample volume. This is being addressed by um, some novel technology coming from a variety of companies, which I've mentioned earlier. So the HEMA pen, the Oterix have come up with a really great solution as well. So potentially we could overcome this. Some of the sampling tubes that are being used, again, are accurate known volumes. What about collecting a representative sample? Clearly it would be great if we could start to use less and less plasma, less and less blood from particularly in a preclinical environment where animal welfare is something that is becoming more and more of interest. And so the driver for the three R's is about reducing refinement and replacing animal. And so if we could look at using less blood from these animals, one, from a, a welfare perspective, it's beneficial, but also from a scientific perspective, 
it's beneficial. We can take more data points and we're not having to use satellite animals in order to complete that PK profile. However, as we take smaller and smaller samples, does that sample then become representative? Finally, another technical challenge is the removal of the matrix components. Human blood is incredibly complex. It has tens of thousands, if not millions of components within it. How do we actually remove all of those components effectively while still keeping intact the very compounds that we're looking for? This becomes progressively challenging as the components that we're looking for start to resemble more and more the proteinaceous material that we're actually trying to get rid of. So as we move towards monoclonals, perhaps their challenges will get bigger. Here's an example of what happens with iron suppression. And so we have at the top part of the slide, we can see that um, a very simple setup where we have our LC pump, the order sampler, and then a HPLC column. And then we're infusing our compound directly into the mass spec for an infusion pump, which is teed in after the HPLC column. We inject a, a blank matrix, um, so an extracted blank matrix, and what we observe from the mass spectrum is the blue trace. And what we see here is that this trace varies with time. So as we normally inject a blank, we shouldn't see a difference in the response from the mass spec. The mass spec should give us a continuous trace because it's been fed by the infusion pump with our compound of interest. But what we see is that as the matrix goes through the HPLC column and separates into its various components, it actually causes a, a, some issues with the signal, so suppression of the signal. We can see that early on there is substantial suppression, and even later on we're starting to see substantial suppression. If we overlay that with when our peaks come out, we can start to see the issue that we get, is that sometimes the signal will be suppressed substantially. Now, if this was consistent, it might not be such a big issue. But what happens is that we optimize our chromatography for the compounds we're looking for, not the compounds we're not looking for. And so this is not consistent from injection to injection because we'll have peaks that are eluting over two or three or even 10 or 11 column volumes. We'll also have peaks that um, will go up and down dependent on the source of the matrix as well. So again, it's not consistent, which means that it is a substantial issue in terms of our analysis. I mentioned about peaks coming off columns over several injections. Um, and here we can see an example. So in injection one, um, we are now looking for phospholipids, specifically looking for phospholipids. The chromatography has not been optimized for phospholipids. And I've scaled everything to the first injection. So the first injection is a blank matrix. And we can clearly see that two of the phospholipids that we're looking for one at mass 496 and one at mass 524, come through on that first injection. Weirdly, the three other phospholipids are not coming through on that first injection, which we would have thought they would have done. Perhaps it's just our sample prep is so good that it removes the higher molecular mass phospholipids. What we then do, injection two, three, four, is we inject water. Water doesn't have phospholipids, so we wouldn't expect to see anything. Injection two, we get a little remnant, and this could just be carryover. Again, we've not optimized our chromatography for removal of phospholipids, so it could just be carryover. But as we get to injection four, we start to see something a little bit weird happening. We start to see compounds coming off the column. And this is from the first injection. And this is one of the issues that we have, is that as these compounds elute off the column, they can cause variable degrees of iron suppression. And we can see that it takes more than 10 injections for it to clear itself off the column. Now, it's not feasible to do 15 or 20 blank injections between each sample. So this then becomes a variable. We'll have variable amounts of iron suppression. Clearly, this presents a massive challenge to bioanalytical science. But it's not just the technical issues. We also get challenged from the perspective of the regulatories. And so guidance here will direct us into what we should be doing. And this can affect... Um, manufacturers in particular who can sometimes become um, a little bit reticent to moving into perhaps clinical analysis because of the regulatory issues associated with producing a medical device of some description. So what could we do to overcome some of these technical issues and also look at ways of driving bioanalytical science? So one way is to look at 
the consumerization of this technology. So one approach that's been developed by um, a variety of organizations, one in particular that I've been associated with is Liverpool University. They've actually generated a CD player which allows you to do sepsis analysis directly from a sample of blood. And so here we now have a CD. We place our sample on the CD. The CD goes into what looks like a CD player. It spins, and as it spins, it performs extraction and chromatography. And then the analysis is done um, either through UV cell or actually through the CD player detector itself. Fascinating technology that if we could scale this up, um, could then mean that everybody could start analyzing their own blood. If this starts to happen, could we then start to look at the mass consumerization? Could this be a driver for change in the industry? Could it be that actually we could take technology for sample collection and actually take it into a, an equivalent of a boot shop in a similar way in which we used to take films? We'd take a picture and instead of having some type of fancy phone which stores electronically the picture it will be stored on film the film would then have to be processed perhaps this is the way this is the future many many people are very interested in their own health and wealth being and actually taking samples is relatively trivial doing the analysis is complex if we can simplify the analysis so that actually it could be done at shops like boots perhaps we move away from having a, a central laboratory a pharmaceutical uh, hospital or contract research organization to having clinical shops where you just take your samples in. That'd be fascinating. Moving beyond this, could we then start looking at miniaturization? Could we start actually look at some of the technology that's available today? Carbon nanotubes, mass spectrometers that fit in the palm of our hands, the ability to type out in single molecules, in single atoms in the case of the IBM, single molecules and atoms actually type words out. Could we take technology such as other watches that we use? These already are able to monitor heart rate, etc. Could we take that technology and couple it to sample collection? So that we've now got something very simple where we can collect our device and then we simply hand over the watch or a section of the watch to our boot shop and then it could then get processed. This is not beyond the realms of possibility and certainly within the next 20, 30 years, as people get more and more driven to know more and more about themselves, perhaps this is something that we should be looking at. And ultimately, should we be looking at technology like a tricorder? Very much Star Trek, but actually there are tricorders available. Um, there is Vital Technologies Corporation sold the official tricorder some 20 or 30 years ago. Comprised of a clock, thermometer, barometer, and a colorimeter, very simple. If we look at the technology that we have within our phones, we can already do spectroscopic analysis of fruit, for example, on our phones. Could we take that one step further? Could we couple that with magnetic resonance? With perhaps um, we could look at desorption electrospray. What about coupling it with a mass spec? Could we put a mass spec into a phone? What about direct analysis in real time, laser diathermal desorption? All of these technologies absolutely could be miniaturized. And if we could couple that to technology that we could put in our hand like a phone, which is already freely available to millions, if not billions of people, perhaps we start to change the way we do bioanalysis. We are truly only bound by our imaginations. And I think in terms of driving the technology forward, we need to look beyond the lab and we need to have a look at the mass populace. I feel that this will be the big driver in the industry over the next 20 or 30 years. This is where we'll see rapid developments in terms of technology improvements. I think within the lab, technology is improving, but it's very slow. Let's look at the way the iPhone, et cetera, revolutionize the way we, we communicate. And let's look at taking our imaginations and, un, and releasing them so that we can look to the future with extreme possibilities of what could happen in the field of bioanalysis. Hi, I'm Simon Cubbon from the Pharma and Biopharma team within the Chromatography and Mass Spectrometry Division of Thermo Fisher Scientific. On behalf of Ken Cook, I'm here to present future analytical trends for the analysis of biotherapeutic proteins and Ken apologises that he couldn't be here to present this to you today.
So when we speak to our customers and industry leaders, there are several common challenges that stick out when it comes to the biopharmaceutical analysis. There is an increased focus on adopting quality by design approaches as discussed in the International Council for Harmonization guidelines. And this is mirrored by the FDA and EMA and many other regulatory bodies within their guidelines. And certainly one of the key buzzwords at the moment is around data integrity. This leads us on to the obvious continuous drive to increase speed and the flexibility of ana analytical systems where customers don't just want to be able to have one single system that can do one thing. They want one system that can do multiple different si things and with increased quality uh, driving cost control as well. And all of this kind of leads into the fact that it's about making sure that not only do you get the right answer, you get it first and every time, not just within the QC environment, but also within the research, discovery and development environments as well. Continuous production and single use technology is no longer a dream, but it's now a reality. And as such, the analysis of products made using these technologies in near real time or as near to real time as possible is required. And additionally, complex multi-step processes and analyses should be reduced to simplified, highly reproducible and robust workflow solutions that are truly fit for purpose. These workflows or tools are generally required to help prove bioequivalence and to monitor for quality throughout the whole development pipeline. So finally, it goes without saying that the increased complexity of these biotherapeutics is forcing new methodologies to not only be developed, but to uh, be adopted as well to address many of these challenges that we're seeing within the industry today. So we'll take a look at where uh, technologies have been improved and is available now and also where technology has been driven and hopefully we'll be, see increasing adoption over the next five to ten years. So if we take an example of what is a complex task, that's to ensure drug safety and quality. We know that these biologics are inherently complex, massively more so than traditional small molecule pharmaceuticals. So we're talking about 150 kilodaltons versus 150 daltons, for example. And this complexity will continue to increase as we drive towards bispecifics and antibody drug conjugates, for example. So if we refer back to the ICH guidelines that spur on changes within regulatory bodies to embrace quality by design, this means that not only biologic developers, CMOs, CDMOs, CROs and vendors um, are changing. They're all seeking to develop and enhance technologies to facilitate the production of these biologics. An example of this would be moving from traditional production using stainless steel through to single use bags or even the elixir of continuous production. But throughout all of this, uh, with the increase in complexity comes some serious analytical challenges. We need to make sure that throughout the drug development life cycle and well into the lot release in QC, that we understand that our product is safe. Is it really going to be safe to use? And does it have the correct potency as well? Do we have enough knowledge about what changes uh, can affect the therapeutic within itself? And again, the overall quality. So this could be how do changes in the overall process affect the end result, the end product. So does glucose concentration affect the glycoforms, for example, and the observed glycoform distribution? So during the characterization and well into the production of biologics, there are many different types of analyses that need to be performed. And here are some examples on the screen, although this is by no means least an exhaustive list. And even when we think about intact analysis, for example, there's many subcategories that go in and form what truly could be considered as an intact analysis. But with the vast number of analyses that are performed and the challenges discussed, can we reduce the analytical complexity? Is there the possibility to get the required data from fewer analysis or indeed fewer methodologies? And are these potential new methods simple enough or robust enough to begin to move into the QC environment or for use within process monitoring? All of this leads us to one such potential that we look at, which is multi-attribute methods. So, how much information can we actually get from one sing single injection? Now, for some time we've been working with many large pharma and biopharma companies whom are looking to utilize such multi-attribute methodologies. And our partners, NIBERT in Ireland, who's a National Institute for Biotechnology Research and Training, are looking at some of our current methodologies and evaluating how we can even improve these further, as well as looking towards production monitoring. So the multi-attribute method we're going to talk about is based upon peptide mapping, 
which in short involves protein digestion, separation of the resulting peptides, accurate mass detection, and then the resulting processing of the data. So for each of these steps, we need to ensure that we have absolute robustness and simplicity, which is where the Smart Digest comes in. It's easy to use, it's highly reproducible, and can provide rapid digestions, certainly when compared to a traditional overnight in-solution-based digestion protocol. Separations have to be reproducible from day to day, system to system, especially if they're going to be, uh, the methodologies are going to be transferred throughout the development pipeline and also deployed to different groups globally. And when it comes to high resolution mass spectrometric detection, again, simplicity is key. Analysts don't want to have to spend time setting these systems up daily. They want a detector that just does its job. And finally, for processing, the software needs to be simple to use something that's already well adopted in QC environments, for example, like a chromatography data system, which ticks all the boxes for global deployment, as well as additional benefits such as controlling systems from multiple different vendors. So if we begin to look at the Smart Digest kit, as the name suggests, it's available as a kit. There are only a couple of components to the kit, as the procedure is a really simple one that involves only three steps, such as adding the protein to a well, incubating and shaking at 70 degrees. This performs denaturation and also the digestion of the protein. And then an optional centrifuge and filter. Now the great thing about this is that it can be automated through the use of the Smart Digest magnetic bead format and the Kingfisher magnetic bead handling purification system. The magnetic beads are moved around on the plate and lane A is the reaction lane where the sample is placed. So to start the reaction, the trips in magnetic beads are moved from lane D to the incubation lane and the temperature is rapidly increased to 70 degrees Celsius. To stop the reaction at the optimized time, the beads are then removed and placed into a waste lane and the temperature reduced down to 15 degrees Celsius with lane A now containing the clean digested, digest, digested peptides. These steps are automated and we'll see uh, really highly reproducible results on the basis of this, even the manual version still produces really robust, reliable, reproducible results. So don't take our words for that. Here we have some actual results of five different rituximab digests which were performed by five different seminar attendees at a recent event that we held in the UK. So each of these attendees were asked to manually prepare a smart digest following the three-step process. These are results that were actually obtained on the same day after the chromatographic separation had been performed in the morning. So the digest was 40 minutes, with the separation being completed in under 20 minutes. And it's important to note that these results are actually the result of not only the individual smart digests, but obviously the chromatographic performance of both the column and the UHPLC employed as well. So outstanding reproducibility with the smart uh, digest kit gave an average peak area RSD of 2.8%, with 11 of the peptides showing well below 2.6%. So even though this was the manual version, this hopefully goes to show that it's quick, easy and reproducible. So something that could easily be adopted within uh, a QC environment, for example. So we've identified the something called MAM or the multi-attribute method and it uses peptide mapping with mass spec detection. Great. But what's it actually going to do for me? So uh, throughout the characterization or uh, QC or lot release, of a biotherapeutic, there are multiple different attributes that need to be monitored for, which require multiple different tests to be performed. So these could be things like size exclu exclusion chromatography, cation exchange, reducing or non-reducing uh, CE, SDS and ELISA. These methods, in short, can be quite lengthy and ultimately provide limited information on these complex biologics. Um, in short, no one method can provide information on more than a handful of attributes. So where MAM comes in is that in a single experiment it can cover a vast range of attributes with high confidence due to the utilisation of this high resolution accurate mass mass spec data faster. And this begins to open up the possibility of bringing the lab to the sample rather than the sample to the lab. Now it's not to say that multi-attribute method can replace all of these analytical technologies as we'll go in and see later. So in short the multi-attribute method is, is created by building up a list of the peptides which relate back to these critical quality attributes, be it glycosylation, isomerism, or indeed if you're monitoring for a specific host cell protein. 
So we create a targeted list and this is all undertaken and validated before it goes into a more routine environment. Now when we move into the routine environment, realistically the main end target is that we're going to get a report which details pass fail, red light, green light, uh, red light, green light for each sample based upon the attributes which have been monitored for. So that the user walks up, enters a sample, chooses which method needs to be run, and then it's just run and they get the report out at the end. So thankfully, all of this could be simply bundled up into an e-workflow within Chromelian Chromatography Data System, for example. And this could be combined in an enterprise environment and the method could be deployed anywhere in the world with ease. It's also important just to note that it's not just useful for looking at what you're expecting to see and how much of that you're expecting to find. The multi-attribute method methodology can also be used to find new features or samples which are out of specification. And because you're utilizing high resolution mass spec data, there's a vast amount of information that can be used there, retrospectively if required. So, as we just mentioned before, there is information that the multi-attribute method cannot provide, such as charge variant distribution. Traditionally, this has been performed using ion exchange chromatography with a salt-based separation. Now, in the spirit of improving analyses, rather than using salt-based separations, which can be hard to reproduce and provide only charge variant distribution, there's now the option to use pre-made pH buffers, where the only preparation step is to dilute the stock solution, something which even I could do. Now the pH based separations are based upon the PI of the protein with the retention on column being disrupted by increasing the pH gradient through the use of these buffers. The combination of ready-made buffers and the use of the pH gradient not only provides highly reproducible results with substantial column lifetimes but also now includes a possibility to couple to mass spec for the intact mass spec analysis of these biotherapeutics. Again, more for less. Not to mention that the separations can be significantly shortened over those commonly employed use, uh, rivaling, uh, using CE-based separations. So if we look at a quick example of a charge variant separation that can be obtained, here we're looking at the separation of trastuzumab. The programmed gradient is clearly reflected in the monitored pH, with the pH rapidly returning to baseline ready for the next analysis. Again, in collaboration with NIBER, there are some great application notes that really do demonstrate the near-universal applicability of pH-based uh, gradient separations for the screening or determination of different types of monoclonal antibodies, with optimization being very, very simple due to the pH-PI retention mechanism, which means that method development is rapidly is much more um, simpler than for a traditional salt-based separation. Now, if we take this same analysis and we push it one step further, We'll take a quick look at the direct MS analysis of trastuzumab by ion exchange chromatography, a native intact MS. So we can see the chromatographic separation in panel A, but when we look at the native intact MS results in panel B, here we see some really nice clear baseline resolved mass spectrometric data. And this is because we haven't denatured our, our protein at all. We're trying to analyze it in as truer conditions as possible, which is why we see um, a smaller charge state distribution and cleaner results. So in the inset panel of the most abundant charge state of 26, again, you can see that they are really nice baseline resolved uh, data. So when we deconvolute this, we can clearly go in and see the nice uh, glycoform distribution with excellent mass accuracy. Now this again demonstrates the possibility of multi-attribute methods where we can achieve much more information with greater confidence from fewer experiments. Indeed, if we take this a little bit further, could we begin to use things like intact analysis or native intact analysis for quantitation within bioanalysis experiments? Could this be something that's more accurate than using a proteotypic peptide uh, or just a handful of peptides for quantitation? So there are many questions that still remain unanswered and I think there are many challenges ahead. But if we think about the conclusions that we can draw from everything that we've talked about during this uh, short presentation, it's clear that vendors are working hard to create workflows that deliver more for less with greater confidence in the results. Um, all of this is kind of trying to solve a lot of the challenges that people are seeing within the industry. So the examples presented here involve the possibility to automate protein digestion, 
providing highly reproducible results in a fraction of the time that it would take to perform a traditional in-solution digest. So it's taking something that could be considered complex or at least a very labour-intensive process and simplifying it down, something that could easily transfer across into the QC or um, highly routine environment where simplicity and reproducibility, reproducibility is required. And we could think about this further by thinking about the use of pH-based uh, gradient separations over salt for charge variants, also in allowing the coupling of MS for native intact analysis. So simple high-resolution MS can give us much more confident identifications in our experimentation. So now we can think about one injection providing so much more information than before, all with increased level of, levels of confidence and simplicity. So all in all, there are new workflows which makes the adoption of these characterization and monitoring methods much easier. As they save time, they're significantly easier to train people on, and it reduces the overall number of experiments and can streamline laboratory processes throughout the development pipeline. Now, it's not to say that there isn't room for improvement. This is only really the beginning. There's much, much more work to do, which will lead to some truly exciting improvements to come over the next few years and beyond in terms of both hardware and software requirements for these companies. So we hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. And if you do have any questions or comments on this presentation, please don't hesitate to contact me at simon.coven at thermofisher.com. Thank you for your attention. So uh, in, this, in this talk, I'm going to look at a swath through the future of some of SIEC's uh, R&D and research that's going on in the area of bioanalysis. Um, so I'm going to introduce a first concept, which is our iron station. So here we have uh, an initial iron station with techniques and, and uh, plug and play of what we're already familiar with, with analytical LC flow, microflow LC, uh, multiplex LC, um, and so on. But the one of real interest at the moment is is direct sampling. And uh, just, just moving off to the edge to our, our standalone station, which, which is direct sampling, and, and all revolves around uh, our open port probe. So here we have a further few extra techniques, some of which uh, we'll look at in a little bit more detail uh, throughout the, uh, the next few slides. Um, so these include uh, SPEMI fiber injection using the open port probe, um, electromagnetic injection using similar fiber technology, uh, some surface sampling imaging, looking at the uh, ability to couple with other analytical techniques inside the uh, laboratory, um, and and a couple other examples of where it could have uh, potential use in the future. And then we come to our second uh, uh, concept, and and this is uh, sans LC. So uh, yeah, for the uh, chromatographers, not necessarily uh, what what we'd like to hear, but uh, going to look at uh, no automation of, of sample preparation and, and without the use of LC. So direct sampling straight into to the, uh, the source of the, of the instrument. So just a bit of background on the open port probe. So there's a couple of uh, publications and uh, uh, from and made the front cover of analytical chemistry, as we can see on the slide here. And uh, for those interested in what it, it actually looks like on, on the source, I might recognize the Turbo V source with a slight modification to allow the open port probe to sit on top of the of the electrospray probe. So the open port probe, uh, there's kind of two modes of, of operation, and uh, the videos that are playing show show both modes. So we have the uh, the touch quan, where basically a uh, a dome or or convex is uh, uh, formed on top of the 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 probe and you just touch a sample onto it whether that is a finger as, as shown or or any other surface sampling um, and it's kept in the flow for a, a given amount of time and, and takes off the sample so um, hence why we've uh, given this the, the probe name touch quan and then the uh, the other mode which uh, conveys itself more with with uh, the techniques I've introduced before is the what we <laughs> happily name the uh, flush quan where effectively a, a, a vortex is formed in this uh, open port probe and 
we can then basically introduce sample in, in a number of different ways, whether it's beamy fiber inje extraction injection uh, or laser particle injection and so on. Um, but the, 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 key, the key with, uh, with the open port probe is it's, it's very simple. Uh, it's, it just sits on top of the electric spray and utilizes the nebula ga nebulizer gas. So it's, it's stable, it's simple and highly controllable from, from within the instrument, which uh, for quantitative workflows is, is critical for our, our data output. And uh, flush quan, why, why do we call that? Well, basically the, the vortex is a continual uh, flow at emptying and draining into the, uh, into the probe. So uh, a bit like, uh, yeah, the sink drains out. So how would, how would this be applied into a few different applications? So looking at the, the, uh, the flush quan approach and with speamy fibers. So the approach here would be to take our classic speamy fiber coated with uh, either C18 or any other polymeric surface uh, or antibodies. Uh, we just dip the needle into our uh, sample, whether that's whole blood, uh, urine, or any other uh, liquid uh, uh, phase. We then move that into our wash station and we give it a bit of a rinse to remove some of the matrix. And then we directly dip and extract the fiber in the open. <coughs> excuse me, in the open port probe for around about five seconds or so, uh, enough time for transfer to the lecture spray and we get a signal. So this is just one way of, uh, sort of really the simplest way of using it. But um, as with uh, posters and talks we've seen, uh, could be applied with with uh, direct uh, tissue sampling and, and, and so on. So really, where can you uh, apply a fiber? What, what instrumentation? So when we look at in vivo sampling and, and moving from the uh, towards the end point of, of bioanalysis and, and the potential of less invasive uh, sampling from um, just direct sampling with with a, a blood sample being taken, or can we attach a a a, a fiber onto the end of a uh, oscilloscope so that it's uh, guided to the location? So uh, say when a biopsy is being taken, we take a mass spec uh, sample at the same time. Um, or with the, the development of transdermal blood sampling, again, can we do some unique uh, touch quan uh, flushing of the surface as we've taken a, a transdermal sample? So, and that's again just a, 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 a flavor of what, what could potentially uh, see as an uh, as, as open port sampling. But then let's take that to the next level. So, what if we uh, wanted to? Have a little bit more selectivity from our sampling and, and a, a little bit more cleanup. So uh, let's move to electromagnetic beads uh, or magnetic beads uh, sample preparation using a similar approach. So instead of say a C18 bonded speamy, we we coat with a, a, a ferrous material so that we can uh, take up uh, magnetic beads. We can transfer to our wash station where we have uh, an electromagnet and the video playing shows two different modes where we have a, a low frequency and then a high frequency and really uh, what happens is that the high frequency mixing with the electromagnetic beads uh, you get a, a incredibly fast uh, mixing and, and uh, separation of the sample basically creating a, a dynamic cloud or a effective thousands and thousands of tiny little uh, spinning magnetic uh, stirrers just extracting out of the sample. Uh, so it's not just the, the fibers, the, the probe, but also the, the way that the sample preparation is, is the whole workflow needs to be looked at and, and uh, the possibilities of what can be done with, with direct sampling. So that's not just uh, the other, uh, the only applications, let's say, um, as the open port probe it can be uh, adapted for with a transfer capillary, can we couple this to other techniques that are are in the analytical laboratory? So, in in work by the uh, the labs at uh, Oak, Ridge Nas Oak Ridge National, where uh, the work is being collaborated with, uh, what if we take the same open port probe and and add it into a laser uh, micro dissection uh, imaging? instrument so with a collaboration with with a Leica instrument so in the video here basically 
uh, we we just add the the open port probe into the uh, into the region of of the the laser imager, and so we uh, take our slide of tissue and flip it, fire the laser at the uh, the tissue sample, and we have the, uh, the the traditional detection, the fluorescence, the UV that comes with the micro dissection uh, imaging. But then we also have the transfer to the mass spec. So we have like a, a triple combo uh, effect where we're, we're getting a lot more information out of a single sample. But the, the beauty of this particular device uh, is, is the spatial uh, um, resolution that's been achieved of, of sub one micron, uh, which is pretty cool when, uh, when thinking about other imaging techniques, which are uh, sort of moldy imaging, which would traditionally be 10, 5, 10 microns. So it is a, a, a real gain in, in, in resolution and, and information, which uh, when we want information, information, uh, it gives us a lot more detail and foresight into our samples. So again, uh, could we couple uh, an open port probe into other analytical techniques, not just laser micro dissection in the analytical laboratory. So if anyone interested on the, the uh, references, uh, so there's two from the last couple of years in analytical chemistry that go through this technique and look at uh, some of the data that can be achieved with the, uh, with the combination with the open port pro. Ultimately, open port probe, uh, as with uh, all direct uh, sampling techniques, from the mass spectrometry side, will suffer and can suffer from uh, iso isobaric interferences, uh, which which is critical when when we uh, are looking at our analytes. So, one of the key advances to go alongside the uh, the, uh, the 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 introduction of the sample into the direct probe. Is, is how we separate those within the mass spectrometer. So this is where really um, select sign and differential mobility spectrometry really comes to the forefront. Uh, and for those, most, most people will be familiar with select sign and its co standard configuration where uh, we use a differential mobility uh, field to separate uh, ions in the gas phase before entering the mass spectrometer. So uh, in in a, a numerous occasions shown that uh, you can separate isobaric components. Uh, now, what what we're researching and looking into is is different configurations. Can we get the same sort of uh, separation power uh, from uh, a high res select sign that would require a little bit more work on on a standard? So, there's going to be a couple of examples uh, in the next couple of slides, uh, but. But basically, we are, we're going to look at this new high-res uh, configuration. So the first example is is a separation of uh, two two isobaric uh, or isomeric components, uh, codeine and hydrocodone, and uh, this is a, an, an analysis where under the standard uh, select sign you would maybe need high not only just high voltage but also uh, the ability of chemical modifiers. Into the uh, into into the system to really to drive the separation apart. Here with with the high resolution DMS without the without using modifier without using uh, the resolving gas, really getting good separation between the isomers, which is great uh, and can really help simplify and and have confidence in our data. Uh, however, of course, we're in a, a quantitative uh, bioanalysis conference. So um, the key here is that not only has it got to separate the ions uh, and the is isomers, but it's also got to be quantitative and stable and robust. So, and that's been shown with the previous designs, uh, and with this one, it's it's no different. Uh, with with the power and and the results that we'd expect to see uh, from a quantitative device. So that's all good, and that's a. a an additional way that before we uh, apply uh, MS or MRM uh, type experiments to our to our detection, and then uh, another example is, is a really uh, a just really tricky example from fluxomics, but uh, looking at uh, phos uh, sugar phosphates and uh, the the wonderful world that that is those uh, types of molecules where chromatography very very difficult. Uh, 
here again it's just an example of comparing the standard DMS with the high resolution DMS and uh, this is work with a group at Pfizer and we can see the standard DMS well it's a big 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 lump of uh, of the four combined components not really showing any separation I have to say here this is with no modifier and no resolution gas so this is uh, not a uh, you may get larger separation than, than that and then with the high resolution DMS and clearly see all all four peaks are uh, resolved uh, from each other so it, it's really a, an, an, int an interesting uh, time for uh, select sign and DMS as a, as a technique uh, if we can get the same sort of resolution or higher resolution power out of the immobility separation uh, without the need for modifiers or resolution gases then we can really expand the capability of where uh, DMS sits. That's that's a real necess uh, necessity in, in being able to drive and expand into direct sampling and direct uh, ionization techniques where you need that extra degree of separation uh, before we enter into the mass spec. So uh, let's uh, yeah take a, a swath through HR uh, for, through high resolution. So uh, as as we know the last few years high resolution mass spectrometry has really uh, really taken off in in across the whole uh, pharmaceutical uh, pipeline. So uh, one of the keys is uh, is is swath. So uh, again a lot of people will be familiar with swath and and the the multiple windows the variable window approach that's taken, but what is the ultimate next goal or the ultimate goal for, for SWATH? Um, and what we're looking at and what we've, we've shown is really the next way that it, we will go with SWATH is, is kind of like the scanning SWATH. So uh, with the variable windows, you have to isolate certain degree of the mass range on, on the quadrupole and then you can do a MS, MS on everything. But actually what we ultimately want to do is just step through the whole quadrupole range uh, and scan sequentially through each of the mass charges to get MSMS. Now this clearly uh, relies on a, the, the power of the quads um, and the whole system, the speed of the system to, can, to cope with that amount of uh, transfer and data. Um, and the video that's just shown is just a, a small snapshot of how much data and the data richness that you really uh, drive into with, with scanning SWATH. And, as with m all of the most of the slides here, uh, the references from uh, the latest uh, data published is is below. So that's one way that we're going to be driving SWATH is for high resolution data independent acquisition. Really, it is the way the way the instrumentation is moving. But then you may ask, um, this is a talk from SciEx. Uh, what about sensitivity? It is mass spec after all. Um, so, what 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 are we driving? What what is the advances coming in sensitivity? So again, this is just a a quick couple of snapshots of um, the quantitative power of high resolution uh, with the triple TOF, and this is with the the current uh, range, the 6600. Uh, we know in the short term future, high resolution is is taking over the world. It is moving across multiple disciplines uh, from uh, a number of different angles. So quantitatively, uh, this is just an example of a antibody digest uh, using uh, amino capture with the BioBA solution. And we can see the instrumentation that we have at the moment is highly sensitive down to those low nanogram per mil levels uh, for, uh, for trastuzumab. So, um, with the accuracy and precision and the robustness that we would expect to see from our traditional triple coiled assay, we are able to achieve that with the latest and greatest uh, high resolution instruments. But what about small molecules? So can't leave uh, an audience without at least uh, seeing a peak of a small molecule. Um, so again, uh, it, it's the flexibility of high resolution um, in this case, a small mark assay at sub two second peak width multiplexed. The speed of, of analysis, which uh, the 6600 in this case delivers, is phenomenal. Uh, and 
the stability it's designed with the mind of the front end of the Sykes triple quad so we know it's robust it's stable uh, and long term stable so uh, really the way that we see the future driving forward is high resolution accurate mass spectrometry taking over a lot of uh, a lot of assays a lot of uh, workflows within the, the quantitative financial lab, lab. Uh, and then the kind of long term future the the ways that we could potentially see bioanalysis in the future uh, with direct sampling at bedside sampling and uh, being able to blend those workflows into to more at patient care uh, so with that Thank you for your attention, and uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to talk. Hello, my name is Ian Edwards, and I'm a Pharmaceuticals Business Development Manager here at Waters Corporation. And today I'd like to talk about recent directions in LCMS adoption for large molecule bioanalysis. Now in this short presentation we'll touch on some of the trends in biopharmaceutical development followed by some of the techniques that are used for peptide and protein quantification in bioanalysis, particularly LCMS, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. We'll share an insight into what's driving the adoption of LCMS for large molecule bioanalysis before moving on to a case study of quantification of a monoclonal antibody, trastuzumab, using the surrogate peptide approach and comparing performance of tandem mass spectrometry versus high resolution mass spectrometry. And then we'll touch on briefly uh, some recent work that's been performed in our scientific operations team, uh, proof of principle of quantification of large molecules, in this instance trastuzumab, at the intact level and the benefit there of being able to make the direct quantitative measurement on the protein as a whole whilst retaining uh, the integrity of the molecule. I'll finish with, finish with a summary and then uh, a couple of snippets, anecdotes on future perspectives. So this slide really illustrates nicely the trend here in novel and eclectic modalities uh, in the biopharmaceutical uh, development, research and development and commercialization. So you know, you've got still got the traditional small molecules there, typically a few hundred Daltons in mass. And then synthetic peptides can be anywhere between a few thousand to 10,000 uh, Daltons. And then we can move up the scale and we see things like therapeutic proteins, monoclonal antibodies around 150 kilodaltons and then increasing complexity of things like fusion proteins. And then also, for example, ADCs, anti-drug conjugates, where the small molecule cytotoxic payload is attached to uh, the large carrier protein. So traditionally, peptide and proteins have been quantified using ligand binding assays, where a reagent is developed which binds to the protein or peptide of interest, and that's used to make a quantitative uh, measurement. Uh, it can be argued that this is an indirect measurement and is really reliant on uh, the integrity of the protein of interest uh, for engagement with the reagent to make the measurement. And for example, if there's a biotransformation, uh, this can uh, call that into question. Uh, as modern mass spectrometers have increased in sensitivity, they're more frequently used in uh, both regulated and non-regulated preclinical clinical uh, bioanalytical studies, particularly PK uh, studies. So the LCMS, there's actually two options, tandem mass spectrometry and high resolution mass spectrometry. Tandem mass spectrometry really is still the gold standard for peptide and protein quantification. Uh, and you can analyze proteins, uh, small proteins, large peptides uh, at the intact level, up to about 10 kilodaltons. And then if you want to analyze something like a monoclonal antibody, we'll do that at the surrogate peptide level where we select a, a unique peptide to make the measurement and we access that by digestion of the protein prior to analysis on the tandem mass spec. As the sensitivity of high resolution mass spectrometry has increased over the last couple of years, there's been growing interest in uh, the use of this system for 
again, uh, peptide protein quantification at the, at the triptych level, the, the surrogate peptide level, but with the uh, TOF analyzer, the time of flight mass analyzer on a QTOF system, we can also analyze large biomolecules at the intact level, for example, uh, monoclonal antibodies and ADCs and fu fusion proteins. And then here we've just got illustrated microflow. So typically the LC system will be analytical flow, uh, but there's always a drive for increased sensitivity in these workflows. And microflow with a smaller internal diameter column uh, increased the uh, ionization and sampling efficiency can boost sensitivity whilst retaining the robustness of uh, analytical flow. So often the uh, one of the questions, particularly in uh, pharmacokinetic uh, studies is, you know, are we measuring the true concentration of the analyte of interest? Uh, and that's uh, open to debate, uh, depending on the uh, the techniques that are used and the integrity of the, the biomolecule. Uh, here we can see in this study, it was looking at the quantitative determination of trastuzumab and some biotransformation products in, in human plasma. Uh, and here on the left, we can see uh, a pharmacokinetic profile for trastuzumab. Uh, concentration here versus time after dose and what we're looking at here is quantitative information derived from a classical uh, ligand binding assay ELISA and that's the uh, the diamond uh, graph in the middle there versus quantitative data from uh, mass spectrometry using the surrogate peptide approach and you can see that there is a, a discrepancy between the the profile using ELISA versus the profile using mass spectrometry uh, and a surrogate peptide, a signature peptide, the, uh, the, top, the top graph, the uh, grey box. And that really uh, is down to the fact that the trastuzumab has got undergone a deamidation in the complementarity determining region, and that's lead, led to a loss in the recognition of the antibody used in the ELISA assay. So the beauty of mass spectrometry here is that if we can find a unique signature peptide which tracks to uh, the protein, we can use mass spectrometry to make a very accurate quantitative measurement of the total monoclonal antibody. And then we can also select other signature peptides which are sensitive to, for example, the biotransformation to start to quantify other species within the, the protein pool. And this methodology can provide novel and insightful information in support of PK studies that can supplement or replace uh, ligand binding assays and are increasingly uh, recognised in uh, regulatory uh, submissions. So just to spend a couple of uh, seconds on uh, the workflow that we use for peptide protein quantification using the surrogate peptide approach. So this is a digested uh, protein bioanalytical workflow applicable for tandem MS or high resolution MS. And it really starts by identifying unique peptides and tra transitions, fragments, that we can use to quantify the protein. And as always, there's some fine-tuning, optimization of the transitions on the instrument for high sensitivity detection uh, prior to performing protein level cleanup, typically uh, immuno affinity enrichment, purification using, for example, protein A, followed by digestion, typically using trypsin, triptic digestion, and then some SPE solid phase extraction cleanup at the peptide level to concentrate uh, the peptides and also remove detergents that may interfere with LCMS analysis. Once we perform the analysis, we can do some data processing and then display the results, and then they can be shared with uh, other stakeholders uh, in the bioanalytical pipeline. So, trastuzumab or Herceptin, the commercial name, it's a monoclonal antibody around 150 kilodaltons and it's been on the market for almost two decades and it's used to treat HER2 positive breast cancer patients and it binds to the HER2 receptor and elicits an immuno response uh, from the body and it's generally uh, administrated uh, by intravenous injection every few weeks and typical doses shown here around blood volumes of around 70 mils per kilogram typically circulating concentrations 6 mg per 75 mL, which equates to about 80 micrograms per mL. So quantification using the surrogate peptide approach, really a cornerstone of the workflow is sample preparation. So here we've uh, taken trastuzumab and used infliximab as an internal standard. And this is in rat plasma, around 50 microliters of plasma. And we perform the affinity purification, as mentioned, followed by triptic digestion 
and on the market today are kits which help to uh, standardize the method and also provide reproducible results for high confidence in the data, uh, giving you that data integrity. And then here, micro elution, SPE cleanup, peptide purification, typically using mixed mode, strong ion exchange and also uh, reverse phase. And then we can inject the sample onto either the tandem mass spectrometer, the high-end tandem mass spectrometer, or a high-end uh, QTOF instrument uh, to perform the detection. So here we're just looking at representative chromatograms for trastuzumab uh, for this signature peptide here in the middle. And on the left we have the tandem MS data versus the QTOF data on the right. And this data was acquired using high specificity, high sensitivity uh, detection modes. Uh, so on the and we've also tracked the, uh, the same transition uh, on each system, uh, the same fragment ion on each system at a similar uh, collision energy. So when we look at the, uh, the ion signal, uh, really going from sort of you know, low uh, micrograms per mil, the limit of quantification uh, on the tandem MS is around two, two times lower uh, than the, uh, the high resolution MS system. But on the whole, the data is very comparable uh, and it's also dependent on the, you know, the sample, sample ionization, and also the method that we uh, use to acquire the data. So when we look at a summary of the data that we acquired in more detail, so here we're just showing for two signature peptides a comparison of performance between the tandem MS versus the, the Zevo G2XS QTOF, the high res system. Again, using the same uh, transitions, the same fragment ions to compare the two uh, signature peptides. So what's striking here is the, the dynamic range, four orders of dynamic range. It's similar across the two, the two systems. But it's fair to say that the TQXS is still the gold standard for peptide protein quantification at the surrogate peptide level, uh, around two times more sensitive uh, than the high-res MS system. And again, just putting that to point on it, that it does depend on the sample, uh, the sample prep, and also the mode of acquisition. So now we're going to move on to uh, look at some intact uh, protein quantification, some proof of principle. So here we'll just review quickly uh, the workflow. Uh, so again, like any, any uh, data acquisition on an instrument, a mass spectrometer requires some optimization and fine tuning of MS conditions. Uh, with the intact workflow, we still it's optional, but we still can perform protein level cleanup, immuno affinity, immuno enrichment, prior to uh, LCMS uh, acquisition and data processing and, and then displaying the results. So we quantified trastuzumab in mouse plasma, again starting with 50 microliters. And in this instance, we use magmatic beads for the immuno affinity uh, enrichment purification and the final volume of 50 microliters. And here we're just displaying uh, some of the data so we can see a chromatogram, a nice sharp uh, peak here, uh, around four minutes retention time for the trastuzumab, and then when we look at the the raw data underlying that chromatographic peak, it displays as a charge envelope. So it's the 150 kilodalton protein intact with multiple tens of charges on it, and you see this nice charge envelope distribution at the 50 plus charge state. It's around 3,000 mass to charge. Various ways of uh, processing data. Uh, in this example we've used the extracted eye chromatogram to uh, integrate the data and take uh, peak area. Uh, so we've done an extracted eye chromatogram at master charge 2907 with a 2 Dalton window and we can see that displayed in the blank moving up the, the concentration range and then the, uh, the raw data displayed on, on the right hand side there. So we're going here from around 0.1 micrograms per mil to 1 micrograms per mil. And when we look at the, the quantitative performance uh, displayed here in this uh, graph, this calibration uh, line here on the left-hand side, we can see we get a dynamic uh, range of around two, two and a half orders of magnitude in plasma. So this puts us in the, the same ballpark as ligand binding assays. The, the performance is on par uh, with a ligand binding assay, which opens up the technique to be used uh, maybe for an, as an alternative, but certainly a complementary technique, especially in non-regulated preclinical studies. So in this slide, we just 
really summarise the, the, the performance data, the comparison uh, of trastuzumab quantification using surrogate peptide or intact. Uh, so we can see here two signature peptides for the surrogate peptide level uh, quantification, uh, tandem MS versus QTOF, and then we compare that to uh, the quantitative uh, performance at the intact level. So you can see about a twofold difference in sensitivity between tandem and QTOF using the surrogate peptide uh, approach, and then about twenty, yeah, the the tandem or the uh, the high res with the surrogate peptide approach is about five to twenty-five times more sensitive uh, than the intact. It's worth bearing in mind that with the intact, we still we monitor or we measure uh, the protein uh, directly uh, as a whole, so we've retained the integrity of the molecule during the measurement. And then you see here there's a small compromise in the dynamic range, around two orders of magnitude at the intact level. So in summary, high resolution MS workflows are comparable to traditional tandem MS. It's worth mentioning that high res MS uh, does have flexibility there for both qualitative and quantitative analysis. Yeah, surrogate peptide level, we'll get into about 0 0.01 micrograms per mil to 0 0.025 micrograms per mil with four orders of uh, linear dynamic range. At the intact level, about 0.25 micrograms per mil and two orders of dynamic range. And it really is worth mentioning here that sample preparation, whether it's for surrogate peptide or intact level analysis, is critical for minimizing matrix interferences and uh, getting good, high quality quantitative data. And it, Really, it can be said that peptide and intact level quantification are both viable options for measuring protein levels in plasma. Very complementary to ligand binding assays in the context of bioanalytical strategies. So just to finish on a couple of future perspectives, really calling out two recent papers here. The one on the left summarising a panel discussion from the community, and it really just points to the increasing uh, complexity of pharmaceutical constructs and the requirement for more skills uh, in the bioanalysis of these components. So, you know, small molecule experts will need to develop skills in large molecule bioanalysis, people skilled in immunoassays will need to develop skills in LCMS, and both groups will need to develop skills in other approaches, you know, not necessarily. Uh, found today in the lab, for example, high resolution mass spectrometry. And then here on the right hand side, a nice paper by Greg Roman uh, really talks about the, you know, the ever increasing complexity of uh, protein biopharmaceuticals and we, how we can uh, analyze them at the intact level and really the need for increased sensitivity, quantitative linearity and spectral uh, resolution, very, very much worth a read. So here just a nod to some educational content. Uh, a peptide and protein bioanalysis application notebook uh, can be found on the, the Waters uh, DMPK microsite. And then here are a nice uh, webinar from Rainer Bischoff, uh, Professor Rainer Bischoff at the University of Groningen, which really uh, goes into some detail on quantification of proteins in complex biological samples by LCMSMS. So I'd just like to finish with some acknowledgements to uh, some of my colleagues here, Yun, who uh, in particular did a lot of the proof of principle work for uh, intact protein quant of uh, trastuzumab on the, uh, the high-res system. So again, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Oh, hi, my name is Neil Loftus. I'm from Shimazu Corporation. And just to let you know this, this disclaimer, it's purely because it's a speculative and personal view of what may happen and in no capacity does it reflect the views of Shimizu Corporation. Now for many of us, our vision of the future may well be influenced by the day, the Esther still, things like Robocop and these various images from different uh, movies. But what I want to present to you is, is how we could possibly see informatics in the future decision making and also about artificial intelligence. So for many, the future looks more than interesting. So from Stephen Hawking's point of view, the development of a full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. So Bill Gates, uh, machines will do a lot of jobs for us and not be super intelligent. After a few decades, intelligence is strong enough to be a concern. So we all have to be mindful of the likely impacts we can actually see in terms of 
mathematics and artificial intelligence. But let me kind of build this up in a, in a certain way. If we actually reflect on how technology is, is created, there's often a way in which all of these technologies are built together. And, and this is one instance by the smartphone. Here we're looking at bringing together key technologies to make the smartphone. And they, these include the microprocessors, memory chips, solid state hard drives. They, these are all key technologies to making change and to making things better. So if we look at the likely impact within separation science, mass spectrometry, how we work with different areas of technology, one of the things that is likely to happen is how these enabling technologies actually affect us as well. So if we look at Microsoft, when we look at Google, and we look at social media interactions as well, these may well point to the likely direction that we'll see informatics and decision-making changes. So, for example, in the case of Microsoft, we're looking at productivity and the future vision. One of the key areas here is the, the impact of visualization tools. And these things are likely to make it easier to share data, to actually use cloud-based uh, data repositories, and just getting things together in a, in a better way. So the visualization of data is clearly going to have an impact in the future. Let's focus on one or two areas, and in, in particular, let's think about informatics in, in healthcare systems. So this is a drive that has been promoted very strongly by the likes of IBM Watson, Google, Microsoft, Philips, these kind of companies. But let me just share a narrative in terms of IBM Watson Health. So IBM Watson is a, is a large 174-terabyte uh, RAM system. IBM Watson Health has started to look at some areas of oncology, and in this particular uh, area, they've actually worked with 300 medical journals, 200 textbooks, 15 million pages of text to design an, an expert system. And in, in recent studies in India and in Thailand, they've been using it to actually compare IBM Watson's diagnostic capability with expert groups and the correspondence between how physicians would actually look at that particular disease, disease process compared to IBM Watson. There was a very, very close agreement. And this is quite an exciting approach in terms of how AI will actually help drive higher efficiencies. If we look at a meeting such as the Healthcare Information and Management System Society Convention, that was normally held in February, this year it's in uh, February 2017, you then can see how the impact of Google are actually working with Fire. Um, Microsoft Healthcare is working with Next. So these are companies that are really trying to look at how artificial intelligence can hi highlight how we can move to higher efficiencies and possibly deliver better decision making. So the key thing really is about informatics in healthcare systems. One of the key questions that we've really got to pose ourselves is really, can we, can we do things better? Can we do things better in terms of accelerating decision-making processes for, for mass spectrometry, for separation science? And can we use the Internet of Things to actually help this process? One of the key challenges in the future is really about a global aging population. And there is really going to be a gap between the number of physicians available to make those decisions and the, the rate in which we have an aging population. So that there has to be a need for AI. And there has to be a way of actually making decisions better based on the results that we actually have. So in one particular projection by 2030, the total physician shortage is projected to be between about 40 to 100,000 doctors. And that's by the Association of American medical colleges. So there is a real need, um, there is a, a real desire to actually think of AI trying to make this process a lot quicker. So how do we actually see this really working within the context of laboratory information and actually using mass spectrometry to detect things, look at separation science? Well, one of the real things really it's likely to change, and it's this process about accelerating a sample to result. So you, you can get the 
a scenario whereby we have these teams of researchers, these teams of technicians. And the key area here is looking at how we can gain a process which is quicker. We're thinking of the focus software for simple sample login and simple software to looking at data review. And then in the sphere, in the, in the area of medical informatics, healthcare informatics, we're looking at how we can kind of follow the lines of immunoassay. This is really important. And the way in which we can do this is to consider how we get more rules to define success and to find errors quickly. It's very likely that we'll move more and more towards cloud-based technologies so that you can actually use the visualization tools from Microsoft and from others in a, in a way that fits workers' needs. Let's look at how the cost model can do this. And that one of the key things that is likely to happen in the future is the way in which we can use AI to actually help make decisions. Is the result okay? Is it defensible? So despite some of the areas that we still really have challenges with, mass peak integration matrix effect, the change is very likely to, to have an impact on how we do our, our workflows. And if I could share with you some of the visions that we already have within Shimatsu, one of the areas that we've been working on is looking at data spaces to review data and make decisions. So this is where you have a rules-based environment. So you can set up a number of different criteria based on the peak shape, looking at whether the asymmetry value is changing. You can then look at how you have better identification, where you can look at spectrum-based identification. So you can have large test panels, but you want this process of reviewing these test panels to be easy, simple, and also to be defensible at the same time. So this particular data space is very rich. You have the tabular information, chromatographic information, spectrum information, and structural information as well. And that can be best suited to a particular advanced research group or to a, a group that is well tuned to, to look at this data. But for a lot of us, these routine assays are very predictable, very easy to manage. And it's likely that you need a different user experience. So essentially, you're using flags to make sure the integration is OK. So look at the way in which the concentration values, and you are moving towards this, this concept of reviewing by exception. So all the data should be OK, and then you're looking for things which are different. And this is where changing the user experience can have a really big impact on how we do the future. So in this particular case, again, it's a healthcare model, but it could equally be applied to food safety, whereby you simply want to look at the, the, the compounds which are actually changing that, that particular patient. So it's, it's accelerating the whole process of data review. It's making it easy. It's making it adaptable for, for particular user needs. And it will be driven by cost. It will be driven by the whole way in which we can make software more adaptable and, and better for different user environments. But, you know, within each user experience that we think about, we also have to work on different user needs. Some people might just want to see a table with information. Others want to have the reassurance of looking how good chromatography works. And again, it's, it's having the flexibility within the, the software to make this happen. And in this case, our software will grow and grow and grow, but I'm sure that other platforms will do the same thing. So it's really trying to build something which is flexible for particularly multidisciplinary team tasks. It's quite important. So we've got the data review, but how about actually analysing the sample in the first place. So we, we want to accelerate this process from, from a sample to a result. And here we've got one example here whereby, again, it's within a, a clinical context, um, work, working in the same way that we're looking at a high throughput, very high demanding kind of area. And the area that we're looking at here is whereby we're probably working in a clinical area, a hospital area, whereby we've got a batch of different samples that we need to do. And in this area, we're looking just at a, a, a touch screen with a sample login. Uh, it's a barcode driven process. 
the whole thing is actually bi-directional communication with the laboratory information system are actually bringing in the data, the accession numbers, the method, the sample identification, those kind of things, in a very simple way, just using something like the HL7, Health Level 7 protocols. And in the future, we'll do more and more with Flyer just to make that work. But the user experience has been designed and adapted so that it kind of works for the, the technician at the time. So if they want to show an old sample plate, they can do so. If not, they don't. They can just work with a simple task list. And it's having that ability to adapt the software for different users in different environments, which is going to be the case. So you have the rich layer of informatics underneath, where you have the, the powerful software for LCMS. But actually, when you show the, the users in routine environments, is a very thin layer and really has the design to meet that particular laboratory need. And I think you'll see that growing and growing, and that's what we're currently working on as well. And just to give you another example of this, again, it's within the, the clinical space. So here we have uh, one example of software that has been specifically designed to look at accelerating the sample preparation for LCMS. And this is a a particularly adaptable solution for emergency samples. So here we're looking at the, the Shimazu Clinical Laboratory Automation Model, but the software that we're saying here has been designed specifically for uh, a simple clinical sphere where you simply put your samples on. You can do very straightforward sample preparation protocols, so for immunosuppressants, drugs for abuse, all of the standard panels of various tests and that's really for the lab environment so to adapt the sample experience really will just help the whole process go forward and then again if we think of how microsoft productivity and the vision for microsoft works the likelihood is that these kind of dashboard experiences are going to be very very common so that you can actually see where the banks of LCMS systems are driving high data quality, but the decision making can be made very simply by, by different levels of management. So here you have one example where you have a, a series of different dashboards in a clinical environment. But in the future, this area will probably change a lot. Cloud-based repositories, different ways of viewing things, remote diagnostics. It's, it's going to be a different way in which people can check the data quality to make sure the workflows are driving the efficiencies that the laboratories actually need. So one of the things that actually drives the mass spectrometry is looking at better data. And this will be another thing as well. It's not just about informatics visualizing it. It's also about driving better quality, and particularly in identification. One of the things about driving faster data requisition where you've actually got a very high sampling rate, you do get higher data quality. And by this, we're not only driving higher sensitivity, but we're actually getting more information. So we can do full scan libraries, we can do MRM-based library identification. And this is a real key component of the future. It's really trying to get better information. So in this case, we've got one particular compound. But instead of looking at one or two MRMs for qualifier ions, there's a standard approach in any quantitative assay. In this case, we can really drive this forward and we're looking at 11 MRMs. We can build up a product ion spectrum and then we can use library identification to really find whether this is working. And this is totally end about reducing false positives and false negative reporting. So this could be the future. This is what we're doing at the moment. We're driving more and more panels to get better identification. And how will this work in the future? Well, if we look at knowledge, looking at metabolomics, this is one particular area where we're looking at different ways of repositories. If we look at these other tools, the likelihood we'll get more connections with software such as Skyline, the Allotrope Foundation, different ways of having vendor neutrality. But the idea really here is to bring together different business models and good ideas. So the, the Allotrope Foundation is trying to create a, a generic approach. Skyline has been a fantastic tool for, for protein metrics. 
Um, with instruments, we're also looking at how you, you try to create a platform to make different instruments talk to one another. We're trying to make software easier, we're trying to connect different software tools. So the big picture really is for routine method analysis, the likely direction to lower cost platforms is going to be key. Having software that makes decision making can accelerate the efficiencies, and particularly in routine things, routine assays, what you can really do is look at AI to make the decision making process 